Good afternoon. So uh, my name is Yi Min Xin. I'm the head of Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. So I'm very pleased to uh, introduce today's speaker in the IAS Nobel Prize Popular Science Lecture Series. And uh, in particular, I feel uh, this, this is a very meaningful event, particularly is to honor also one of the Nobel Prize who happened to be a chemical engineer, Francis Arnold. So, uh, so the reason why uh, Professor Sun Fei is giving a talk here because of uh, he uh, clearly has affiliation with Francis. And uh, you know, uh, chemical engineering community globally is not a very, very big community. So many of us will know Francis Arnold bind to each other in ASTH meeting and many others. So um, you know, there are many of the uh, important figure, towering figures in chemical engineering field. And Francis is definitely one of, one of them. And HHKUST has uh, hosted many of the kind of towering figures in chemical engineering field, including Robert S. Langer, Alu Chalabodi, and uh, Christy Anses are the good examples. So uh, before I introduce uh, my colleague, Professor Sun Fei, let me just give you a little bit story I, why I believe uh, Francis will go into <laughs> protein evolution field. I guess uh, some of you probably did not know that uh, Francis Arnold, her undergraduate was actually not in chemical engineering. Her undergraduate is actually in mechanical engineering. She got her undergraduate degree from uh, Princeton University in mechanical, mechanical aerospace engineering. And uh, when she was young, she's a relatively uh, punny, okay? I mean, she has a lot of her own opinion, pretty much like now. And then, uh, I, I, in my own opinion, that uh, she got the inspiration to go into protein engineering is actually was due to her PhD work in Berkeley, who is uh, Harvey Brank, who is a very famous uh, biochemical engineer. And Francis is a PhD thesis was in the field of uh, affinity separations, more like large scale protein, uh, protein separations. So clearly because of, she probably understood the difficulty in separating proteins. So with that, I guess uh, she gave interest in trying to find ways to improve protein designs because of uh, there are many of the, for those of you who have been working on proteins, knows that you really need to work on the very small kind of epicide changes in order to design better protein-protein interactions. Then you know, the only, if you got so much frustrations, the best way is to learn from nature, right? So direct evolution is actually just tell you when you run out of solutions, maybe you should go back to learn from the nature. So as a chemical engineer, I think uh, Francis pretty much follow the best design principles from the law, from nature. And uh, that lead to one of her biggest achievements to won the Nobel Prize uh, just very recently. And uh, we all know that she's one of the very few female scientists uh, winning Nobel Prize in chemistry, probably one of the five. Uh, if in the field of chemistry and physics, there are only actually nine female scientists uh, got awarded Nobel Prize. And surprisingly, this year there are two. One in physics, one in chemistry. And I think uh, Professor Sun Fei uh, in the greater China community could not be the better person to introduce uh, Francis Arnold's uh, achievement. I personally read uh, recommendation data from Francis Arnold when we recruited uh, Professor Sun Fei. I could, only, I could not re reveal the uh, older paragraph. What she wrote, I can only tell you that uh, Professor Sun Fei was uh, highly recommended was considered a young rising star and could see, consider the person who can make differences in this field. So uh, Professor Sun got uh, his undergraduate from the best chemistry department in China, which is Peking Youth <laughs> Chemistry Department, and uh, in around 2007. So he's much, much younger than me. And afterwards, uh, he went to uh, Again, one of the very uh, 
highly recognized uh, chemistry group in University of Chicago, uh, Professor Chang He's group. And uh, that's about 2012. And uh, I guess he was uh, lucky and unlucky to join uh, Francis Arnold's group as a postdoc. And uh, for those of you uh, in the chemical engineering field, know that uh, Francis is uh, highly talented, has a pretty much uh, recruited best researcher to work with her, but uh, I, don't, I don't believe she has the best temper <laughs> in the, in, in the, <laughs> among her many of the attributes and uh, reputations. I'll elaborate more later. Okay, yeah. so, uh, so Professor Sun obviously survived and did very well. Uh, in her, in her group, then uh, actually uh, couple, uh, last year, he just, uh, he and his group just uh, developed very, very interesting. Also using uh, direct evolution-based approaches to come up with very, very interesting hydrogel. So I was so pleased that uh, IS was able to, in addition to recognize uh, Francis, in addition, uh, in the meantime, take this uh, opportunity to recognize uh, Professor Sun Fei for his young achievement, as well as uh, a recognition for his uh, uh, research in this uh, very important area. So without further ado, please join me to welcome Professor Sun Fei, today's speaker. Many thanks to Professor Yim Min Shin, and as well as Prudence, you know, for putting together this wonderful event. So also I want to, you know, appreciate IS for making me a speaker for this wonderful event. Uh, since, as Yimi mentioned, right, there are many great researchers who have made a great contributions to this particular field, protein engineering and the direct evolution. What I'm doing here is just trying to navigate through those literatures, many of which actually dated back to decades ago, and try to figure out what has happened and more importantly, what might happen in the near future, enabled by this amazing technology, so-called directed evolution. So let's begin with some important challenges facing the field of chemical and biological engineering. So I want you know, want you to think about these challenges. And through this lecture, at the end of this lecture, I want to, some of you you know, to be able to come up with certain solutions or at least some ideas in terms of how to deal with these challenges. So the first challenge is widely known in the field of biofuel industry, okay? People are looking for biocatalysts, particularly known as enzymes, that can convert biomass into small molecule sugars which can be further utilized by living organisms to produce biodiesel. Uh, in a very efficient manner. So one requirement is that these biocatalyst enzymes can survive, can work, function well at high temperature. In doing so, they can be adopted or integrated with the existing infrastructure used for chemical plants. A second challenge would be opposite. Can we develop a milder condition that will allow us to convert methane to methanol? Nature is able to do it. There are some microorganisms living in the bottom of the ocean that produce the enzyme known as methane monooxygenase, a protein that can convert methane to methanol. But that enzyme is very complicated, very small, or very big, okay, and also unstable. The turnover rate is very slow. So can we find a way to design an enzyme that can do this, can do it fast, can do it under milder physiological conditions? So if we can do that, we will save a lot of energy. We can also make a better use of natural gas for producing you know, gasoline or other uh, electricity generation, for example. The third one is, you know, can we enrich uranium from the ocean, from seawater? So this is known as one of the seven chemical separations you know, ranked by nature. They say you know, it could change the world. Right? Nuclear power is one of the relatively clean energy, okay, that comes with low carbon emission. But the problem is the current nuclear power industry heavily relies on the uranium source that's derived from land mining. 
the process can lead to pollution in the underwater, uh, groundwater system, you know, irreversibly. On the other hand, the ocean contains a vast amount of uranium. But the problem is the concentration of uranium in seawater is extremely low. There's no economic and efficient way to enrich them. So can we come up with a chemical process to address this problem that may be able to enable the humanity you know, last for another 8,000 years? What's the coming one? So we talk about the energy, right? The fourth challenge would be biomedical related. Can we develop stable protein drugs? Without complicated formulation, these drugs can survive in our blood serum. Okay, that can reach you know, the disease site. So I just give you one simple example. This is arginase, bacterial arginase. I already showed it, uh, exhibited the activity that can inhibit the growth of tumor by depleting arginine, one of the building blocks for protein synthesis. The problem is this bacterial arginase is very poor in terms of this reaction, okay, catalyzing this reaction. Also, they got quickly active, inactivated in the serum. Can we find a way to improve, optimize this enzyme to make sure they can survive and ensure their success inside human body? And then we can convert that into a useful therapeutic. Can we do that? The fifth one is more fundamental, okay? If you look into central dogma, DNA, RNA, protein, what do they share in common? They're all linear polymers. Okay, in terms of topology, they're simple. So the question I want to ask is, can we use cellular machinery to make nonlinear polymers? So if we can do that, we may be able to have access to you know, new materials with property that have never been explored before. So these are the five challenges I just uh, presented here. So is there any simple yet universal algorithm that may help us address these challenges? Is there any universal one? So th there's an old saying in, Chinese, in China, right, in Chinese. So we, we call it shi fa zi ran. Okay, this is according to Taoism. Okay, this is a philosopher, you know, came up with this idea, you know, thousands of years ago. Right, we need to learn from nature if we are puzzled or facing difficulty in our lifetime, okay? So we, we enjoy greater ecological diversity, no, which was made possible by mother nature, okay? How did nature achieve this? So somehow, you know, nature figured a way to write using simple building blocks, okay? like ATGC, to write a very, the script of a very complicated script known as life. So in which structure and a function at the molecular level can arise, okay? So can we follow what nature has done and learn from nature, repeat the process here? Can we write a script a string of sequence that compose simple building blocks to derive function, derive structure and the function from these combinations. This problem in the field of protein science and protein engineering is also known as protein folding problem. Can we deduce three-dimensional structure or function from primary sequence of amino acids? Also known as design problem. Can we, if we have a function or certain structure in our mind, can we do the other way? You know, come up with a string of sequence that will lead to the structure. Just to use, you know, 20 different building blocks used by nature. Can we do that? It's not a simple question, right? Simple problem. Because imagine, I just give you one example here. Think about this, insulin. The smallest protein in our body, inside our body. It consists of 51 amino acids. So in order to design something that as useful as insulin, we have to, you know, nature already achieved this. Nature is able to, you know, search through this a vast a collection of 
combinations of amino acid sequences, which constitutes a space known as protein sequence space. This is this number is huge. Okay, 50 to the 20 to 51. This is big number, much larger than the housing price here in Hong Kong combined. Okay, and also it turned out that the protein sequence space, if you notice that, it's very vast, empty. Now. Some of you may like it because we live in Hong Kong. We're looking for space that's vast and empty. But for protein engineers, that's not the case. We're looking for something meaningful in this vast, empty space, which is full of nonsense. Okay, can we say, you know, hold a stone of hope out of this mountain of despair? Or can we find something meaningful out of this, of telos, purpose, whatever you call it? out of this vast space. And also, there's another terminology to describe the function. It's called fitness. You can define it. If we are interested in catalytic efficiency, we're just looking for you know, improved reaction rate. If we are interested in, say, thermal stability, we're just looking to, which is, can be called fitness. Okay? It can be any parameter or physical property you are interested in. Can we do that? How can we walk through this protein sequence space and identify something that's useful? So what nature has done, you know, nature used a, a tool known as evolution, right? They just uh, randomize or change certain amino acid composing in certain size regions, and then they were able to walk through the protein sequence space step by step. It's known as evolution. But what's the purpose of evolution? We know. There's a rule in natural evolution called uh, survival of the fittest, okay? But in our daily life, you know, when researchers conduct their experiments in the lab, we have a purpose. We want to inject a sense of meaning into directed evolution, it's, this, into evolution. This is called the directed evolution, okay? We want to inject a purpose for protein evolution in the laboratory. So, can we evolve protein molecules in the laboratory? This is not a, the idea actually uh, come up with by Francis Arnold. Actually, uh, one of the greatest chemists in the 20th century, Manfred Agent, who is in the field of fast reaction kinetics, okay, proposed this or envisioned the possibility of evolving protein molecules in test tubes. But also he laid out the challenges we have to overcome in order to achieve this. One of the greatest challenges is that you know, we have to be able to connect the genotype, which is carried by DNA sequence, with the phenotype that is carried by protein molecules in a you know, sh surest way. Okay? We have to connect them because they are carried by different molecules. Can we reconcile this distinction in the process of directed evolution. Because we are changing DNA sequence. And in the end, we are looking to the protein function. Okay, can we reconcile that conflict? And also, can we construct a machine that will enable us to quickly look into the function of these protein molecules in a high throughput manner? We have to overcome these two. So one decade later, it is Francis Arnold and his, her student, who were able to demonstrate we can achieve protein-directed evolution in the test tube. Okay. What they did is just they introduced random mutagenesis into a protease, which is known as uh, satellisine. Okay. And then, after multiple rounds of random mutagenesis, they did the aeroprone PCR, they can play with the condition. They re reduce some amount of you know, metal ions, and then they change the stoichiometry between DNA building blocks, A, T, G, C. They can play with the stoichiometry. They were able to make the amplification process error prone. Okay, by doing this, do it repetitively, they were able to evolve a catalyst, an enzyme that can work in the presence of huge amount of organic solvent. So this is becomes one of the first enzymes that can survive in 70% of organic solvent, known as form amide. Okay? This is significant. And through this work, Francis' group is able to, was able to master the flowchart 
uh, workflow for directed evolution. Basically, she summarized four important steps that's essential for directed evolution. First, you need to be able to identify a starting point, a good apparent protein that can, for, can be used for directed evolution. One thing, you know, you have to find a very low activity of the enzyme. You cannot evolve something from nothing, okay? You first have to find an enzyme that carries some low-level activity. And then you subject that to randomization. You introduce mutations to work through the protein sequence space step by step by introducing limited randomization. It's called an error-prone PCR. And then you have to come up with a, this is very important, okay? This is the essential for the success of directed evolution. You have to be able to find a way to quickly assay all these genetic variants in a high throughput manner. Okay? They did it in 96 well plate format in early days. Okay, that's the most commonly used one. And then you find those, you know, the fittest, the, the, the hits, we call it the hits, okay, that, that should improve uh, tolerance toward organic solvent in that case. And then you just subject it to another round of directed evolution until you know, the behavior of the protein or the property of the protein uh, is, can satisfy our need. Okay? So what's the problem? You know, think about this. If we just do random mutagenesis, what's the problem? At a certain stage, after a certain round of directed evolution, you may end up with multiple hits or candidates that showed comparable efficacy or you know, reaction efficiency or tolerance toward organic solvent. How can we move further? If we have multiple, let's like say you have five candidates that showed similar improvement, how can we move further? So there was another guy, William Stemmer. Just one year after Francis published their work in PNAs, okay? William Stemmer came up with this solution called the DNA shuffling. They were able to combine these genetic variants in test tube to do in vitro recombination of these genetic variants. Okay, they do hybridization in vitro. What they did, they can mix these parent genes and then digest it with DNA, chop them into fragments. And then they were able to find a way to repeat them together to form chimeric genes. Then, in doing so, we, they were able to create a library that contains, you know, genetic variants that's derived, that are derived from those parent genes. And in doing so, they were able to propagate these beneficial mutations from the previous rounds of directed evolution. They were able to accumulate those improvements in the following genetic decedents. Okay? That's what they did. And in doing so, combining random mutagenesis and DNA shuffling process, they were able to facilitate the process of directed evolution. Okay? So, the message here is that if you can do both random mutagenesis and that DNA shuffling, in principle, we can evolve any enzyme or protein molecules in our lab. Okay, just need two, these, these two great tools. And of course, you know, because of this groundbreaking contributions, both Francis Arnold and uh, uh, Stem William, uh, William Stemmer, were awarded with this Draper Prize in Engineering. This is also known as a Nobel Prize in Engineering, okay, because there's no real Nobel Prize for Engineering. So this is the one that is as important as Nobel Prize. Sadly, uh, William Stemmer passed away just two, two years ago because of brain tumor. Okay? Otherwise, I'm pretty sure the Nobel Prize this year will, would go to Francis Arnold and uh, William Stemmer. Okay, that's the sad story, but uh, you know, life is complicated, but science is always fun okay, in this process. So following, on this, following this DNA shuffling, you know, came up with by William Stemmer, Hui Min Zhao, one of the earliest Francis Arnold students, further improved this in vitro recombination process. Basically, they were able to combine error-prone PCR and this in vitro combination process in one PCR reaction. 
Okay, it's just a change in the protocol for PCR. It can do both in one step. Okay, that's what uh, Huimin did. It's called a step based in virtual recombination. And actually, Huimin will come, I think, uh, mid December to give a talk about uh, bowel systems design enabled by directed evolution. His lab was able to apply directed evolution principles into engineering of complicated biological systems, not only protein molecules, but all the other you know, living systems. So because once we have DNA shelf and the uh, aeroplane PCR, we can do a lot of things. That's indeed what you know, the past two decades have witnessed. Okay, so there are several important uh, applications. Some of you may be familiar with. Okay, this is one uh, Nobel Prize winning technology. Basically, Osama discovered this green fluorescent protein. It's genetically encoded in jellyfish in 19, early 1960s. And then three decades later, another bioengineer, Roger Chen, took over. They applied the principles of directed evolution to quickly diversify the toolbox of genetically encoded fluorescent molecules. They began with, just started from two parent proteins. One is called a green fluorescent protein, the other is called red fluorescent proteins. They were able to quickly expand the collection of these genetically encoded tools. And these tools are nowadays are widely available, widely used in biology labs, okay? And this is just one example. And another example would be, if you still remember, one of the challenges would be, how can we design proteins that can convert small molecule alkyne into alcohol? If we can do that, we can revolutionize the oil industry, okay? How can we do that? So in nature, there are a variety of enzymes known as cytochrome P450. This is the enzyme can convert long aliphatic acid into, you know, do oxidation to install oxygen molecule into these long aliphatic chains. So built upon this natural enzyme through multiple rounds of direct evolution, Francis Arnold's lab was able to convert this enzyme into this so-called ethane or propane monooxygenase. So this enzyme can oxidize those small alkyne into small molecule alcohols. So this is what they did, it's a decades of effort, okay? They were able to oxidize, to generate ethanol by oxidizing ethane. What else can we do? So Michael Shapiro, in collaboration with Francis Arnold's group, uh, come up with even crazy idea, okay? This P450 can not only be used as a catalyst for certain organic reaction, it can also be used to detect, uh, as a sensor to detect important small molecules inside of the body. What she did is just introduce several mutations through random mutagenesis and the recombination, in vitro recombination. They were able to convert this enzyme into a dopamine sensor. It's an MR contrast agent. How does that work? So basically, Without the substrate, dopamine, okay, this enzyme, the active site is occupied by water molecules because this water is close to the cofactor. It's a heme center, contains a ferric ion 3. And then it generates MRI signal. So once you have dopamine level increased, so the dopamine will kick out water molecules and then MR signal will be gone. That's the principle, you know, how we can take advantage of these engineered proteins to image the distribution of dopamine in the nerve system, okay, inside of the body. So, what else? Arnold's group also demonstrated that just uh, started from a bacteria or some pro simple proteins, it's known as cellulase, derived from the fungi or some bacterial cells. This is an enzyme that can convert bone mass like cellulose into small molecule sugars, okay? But the problem is the natural one is very slow in doing this type of reaction. You know, as a, some of you have some chemistry background, okay, how can we speed up the reaction? The most obvious way would be 
can we raise the temperature, speed up, accelerate the reaction? If you increase temperature by 10 degrees, the chance is good you are going to increase the reaction rate by two to three fold. That's a thumb rule, okay, widely known by you know, junior chemistry students. But the problem is many protein molecules or enzymes can work on, under mild physiological condition. That's a narrow window from four degree to 37 Celsius. So, so Arnold's group was able to evolve an enzyme you know, through multiple rounds of directed evolution to improve its stability, thermal stability. So in the end, these work, okay? At the end of the day, these enzymes can survive and even work well at 90 degrees. Okay, that's what they can do with directed evolution to dramatically improve the thermal stability of protein molecules. So I, I think, you know, after two decades, right, the lab should be, that's the moment where, when I joined the lab, okay, the lab should be complacent. So people, the, the idea has been circulating around, you know, people flirt with the idea that Francis May went over price, okay, in the near future. It sounds to, Many junior students, okay, we don't have to do anything. We just uh, sit and wait, okay, to harness, harvest the big price. Okay, that's all we need to do. And, uh, you know, actually, that's what, that's the case, right? In 2011, you know, Francis got uh, this award in the National Medal of Technology, okay? It's, this is the photo of him, uh, Fred, uh, Barack Obama and Francis Arnold. So, Drupal Prize, that's another big award for her lifetime achievement in the field of engineering. So it, it seems, you know, we indeed had a great time back then. I joined the lab in 2012. This is a golden era and uh, for Arnold's lab. And uh, I, I have to correct uh, Yimin because Francis, at least, you know, is always nice to me. And uh, I never see her be angry or be, you know, show any bad temper, okay? That's not the case. Uh, he's, she's always supportive. When I ask for a recommendation later, she said, okay, just uh, let me know where you want to apply. And also, she keeps sending me email, you know, these four calls, uh, where there's, wherever there is a job opening, she just forward me the email and uh, let me know the most updated information about the, about the job market. Also, another thing, I still remember in the, Swarting some afternoon in California, okay? She would uh, just walk me across the campus to visit a very junior assistant professor, uh, a, a, another lady known, you know, as Viviana Gradinello, another neurobiologist on campus in Cal at Caltech. Walk me half of the campus to visit that young lady to talk about the potential collaboration, okay? So, not the other way. She didn't ask that young lady to come over and we talk, okay? This is opposite. So she's very down to earth in this sense. Also, she always enthusiastic about science, okay? We, we didn't talk about, you know, in group meeting or whatever social gallery. She didn't talk about things randomly, okay? She just uh, sometimes ask about your personal life, you know, whether you are okay with the lab environment or culture or whether you can do something that's more, uh, that's different, okay? You can distinguish yourself from others in the lab, okay? That's another mindset which I can cultivate in Francis, by working with Francis Arnold. So we, we had a good time, you know? The, this is the first day I joined the lab. We had a big pig party. Uh, the party is not for me, but I happened to, you know, to enjoy that party during my first day at Caltech. And, uh, it's nice, and uh, now the lab size is increased dramatically, okay? Trust me, you can go online and find out the most updated photo. For the group, we did a lot of hiking, and this is the cabin owned by Francis Arnold in this valley, okay, in near Arcadia, okay, there are another small city near Pasadena, okay? This is the cabin. I I'm not sure whether it still exists there because of the fire, okay? Uh, well, we had a good time, but uh, I, I think uh, it turned out that, that after 2013, it appears to me 
science or research in our lab turn out to be more exciting than, at least to me, okay, it's more exciting than what I, when I navigate those old literatures. Because with directed evolution and with the accumulation of big library of these enzymatic uh, enzyme variants, P450, for example, we were able to really dig into these libraries and uh, identify new chemical reactions that doesn't exist in nature, but can be catalyzed by those genetic variants, okay? So another thing I want to remind you, because this is something you have to keep in mind when we discuss about the further developments about the directed evolution, okay? So if you want to evolve a new chemical reactivity, you have to keep in mind when you do directed evolution, you have to begin with some enzyme that is promiscuous, okay? We, we said that the natural evolution doesn't have a purpose, doesn't have a telos, okay? They just sit there waiting for us to discover those promiscuous activity. Although, you know, we, we said that this P450 enzyme is good at oxidation to convert aliphatic alkane chain into alcohol, right? But the, it depends if you just artificially mix the enzyme with some other bizarre substrates. Some new activity may arise, okay? You just wait for us to discover those new reactivities. As long as we can get some low minimal level reactivity, then we can pick it up. We can use directed evolution to further, you know, improve this, okay? We can inject a purpose into these enzymes. That's called a directed evolution. Okay, so this one doesn't work. You have to go after the enzymes that show the promiscuous activity. Okay, that's important. And uh, just to think about, uh, just forgive me if I talk too much about chemistry here, okay? Uh, but uh, I think this is a good story or a good narrative to tell, okay, here. So think about this P450. How do they oxidize substrates, organic compounds? This enzyme contains a cofactor. This is an iron protoporphyrin. It has an iron center, which sits in the middle of the protein, in the center of the protein. There's a hydrophobic pocket. Okay? In the presence of oxygen, it gets converted into this widely you know, famous compound known as compound one, okay? oxo uh, iron 4 complex. This is the reactive species that can activate the CH bond and insert oxygen to create CO bond. What can we do? So, one postdoc, Eric Brasted, he used to be a PhD student with uh, Peter Schultz in Scripps. He joined the Francis Arnold lab. He imagined, can we use these enzymes to create carbon-carbon bond, carbon-nitrogen bond, even carbon-silicon bond? Because these are reactions are widely used in synthetic chemistry lab. And uh, people are looking for a catalyst that can do this type of reaction. But can we simply just uh, replace oxygen here with carbene or nitrogen, right? Then we can convert this enzyme to, following a similar catalytic cycle, we can convert this enzyme to a new catalyst for completely different unnatural reactions. Right, how can we do that? So can we hijack directed evolution? Can we hijack this natural enzyme for new reactions? Remember, as I just mentioned, okay, we need to, first we need to check whether the natural enzyme, what type of enzyme can catalyze the reaction of interest, right? And then if with the enzyme, natural enzyme can do that, we can take advantage of directed evolution to further improve the efficacy or efficiency of the process. Right, before we jump into directed evolution, first we need to check whether the natural enzyme can do this. Sorry, the laser is not working well. Yep. They tested, it turned out that Pedro, the graduate student, worked in the lab, tested this reaction. It showed some minimal reactivity, the Y type enzyme, just mix, even if you simply mix him with the substrate, it can convert with this diazole acetate, okay? The, one of the starting material that can generate 
carbene species. Okay, then you can create a carbon carbon bond. This is a cyclopropane resulting from this reaction. You can do that. Okay, once you have this reactivity, they apply the direct evolution. Okay, they were able to dramatically improve the efficiency of the reaction. And uh, if we have chemists here, they will be super excited because in some variants, if you just change one residue, this is a big protein, contains around 250 amino acid. If you just flip one amino acid residue, you can change the stereochemistry, you can change the orientation of the resulting material. It's a dream goal for a lot of people who are working on, you know, asymmetric catalysts, okay? And, uh, but the problem is, it turned out that the enzyme is not stable. Also, it's not compatible. Although they can, with the direct evolution, they can do a lot of, you know, turnovers in the test tube, but it's not compatible with living system. The beauty of protein is that, in future, we can integrate it with living system. We can use cellular machinery or cell as a factory to produce these compounds. But with this enzyme, we cannot do this. Because when you do this type of reaction, you have to add a very strong reducing agent to jump start the reaction. Okay, the RNA3, RNA3 in the heme has to be reduced to RN2, and then it can be used to catalyze the reaction, okay? So, how can we address this dilemma, okay? One hand, this protein in test tube can show good reactivity. But on the other hand, if you put them into cells, they don't show this reactivity. How can we accommodate, reconcile this conflict? So this Pedro is clever. He just uh, looked into something, think out of the box, look into something nobody else has ever looked into. So there's a ligand. It's called a cysteine. There's a software that coordinates with the RNA. Okay, this cysteine residue is highly conserved in P450 protein family. This is a big family. This type of protein exists across all the forms of living systems. He replaced this cysteine with another residue called a serine. They are very similar to each other. You only need to replace sulfur with oxygen. Okay. Conventional wisdom believe that you know if you abolish, remove this cysteine, the protein will not be able to bind to the cofactor because it serves as a coordinating ligand. And also, even if it can still bind, but that doesn't give you natural property of interest. But regardless, they did it. It turned out that yes, the enzyme changed the color. You know, the color, you know, the original enzyme is red. And then once they replace that, the enzyme become green, okay? And also the most important thing is that with this type of enzyme, you can just express them in E. coli and then use the whole E. coli as a whole cell, as a catalyst. You can also convert the you know, substrate to generate this cyclopropane product. You can do this carbon transfer reaction. What's the magic thing that's going on here? So basically, if you replace sulfur with oxygen, you can dramatically increase the redox potential of the RN center, okay? Then those mild, moderate reducing agent inside of the cells will be able to reduce RN3 into RN2, and then you can jump start the reaction to generate the carbene, and then transfer the carbene to generate cyclopropane, okay? And then, they even did another crazy thing, okay? They just did a saturation mutagenesis. What's the meaning of that? You can replace cysteine with the other 19 possibilities, other 19 possible amino acids. It turned out that many of these genetic variants also can show unexpected reactivity and stability in living system, okay? This is something nobody has thought about this before. Not only that, you can also not only create a carbon-carbon bond, you can also use this enzyme to create a carbon-silica bond and a carbon borate bond, okay? You, you, it's carbon transfer. The carbon can be inserted into SIH, you know, silicon hydrogen bond, and uh, it can also be inserted into borate, you know, hydrogen bond. So you can create a variety of 
unnatural artificial chemical bonds use this type of enzyme. So this type of enzyme can also be very sophisticated in creating very complicated natural, uh, unnatural compounds. It can convert this alkyne, triple bond. You, you can do double propocyclination, uh, generate you know, double cyclopropane to create this bicyclic structure. Okay, this paper was also published in Science because this is a completely unnatural reaction and also you can generate a very complicated product with this type of technology. So people may ask, what did you do in Francis Arnold lab? So far you haven't talked about what you have been able to accomplish. So when I joined the lab, you know, Francis asked me, can you think about something which is different from what other people is doing in the lab, are doing in the lab? Can we think about the, out of the box, okay? Pedro did that. He, he replaced those cysteine residue, highly conserved in P450 enzyme, replaced that with a variety of other residues, and then which lead to new reactivity. So if we look into protein sequence space, we emphasize in conventional or traditional protein engineering, we emphasize the importance of sequence, okay? Size, we do truncation, we make the protein more concise, more stable. Okay, and uh, of course, unless you use unnatural amino acids, we don't need to care about stereochemistry because look into all these 20 amino, natural amino acids, except uh, glycine. They are all L amino acids. You don't have to worry about the stereochemistry unless you use unnatural amino acids. So traditional protein engineering focuses on these three dimensions. Okay, what, are, what else can we do? So if you're a polymer scientist, protein is a polymer by nature, okay? When we talk about the property of a polymer, we always talk about four aspects, right? Size, sequence, stereochemistry, what else? Topology, okay? But in, sadly, most of living, you know, biopolymers in living systems, they are linear, right? They are linear. So can we introduce another dimension for protein engineering or directed evolution in general. Can we engineer the topology of protein molecules? Can we have a control over these engineered protein molecules? How can we do this? Again, we are puzzled. We don't know where to go. What shall we do? We look into nature, okay? We get inspired by nature. So, so the rationale is that if we can make those nonlinear polymers, we may have access to materials or new molecules with properties that never be explored before, right? So how can we do that? This is a, you know, a, another side note, okay? In the past few decades, in all important biotechnologies, most of them, are derived from our understanding or new knowledge about you know, biological process in some simple organisms, PCR, CRISPR-Cas9, or think about this channel rhodopsy. This is the protein derived from marine microalgae, okay? So it turned out that this, uh, the same organism that contributed CRISPR-Cas9 technology, okay, this is called a streptococcus pyogen. This is gram-positive bacteria a human pathogen, okay, causes disease. The surface of this protein contains a multi-domain protein called a PLI, which is believed to be involved in host pathogen interaction. An important feature is that this PLI, this protein contains a isopeptide bond, a co covalent bond formed between lysine and aspartate residues. Nature is able to engineer protein topologies. Think about another molecule inside our body, insulin. This is not a linear molecule. After central dogma, after translation, yes, it's a linear polymer. But there's another process in nature called post-translation modification. Nature was able to encrypt this type of information into the genetic sequence. And then they can control the formation of disulfide bonds, or in this case, uh, isopeptide bonds, between protein polymer chains. Okay? 
can we harness this type of phenomena, post-translational modification, to engineer protein topologies? That's the question we want to answer. How can we do this? How can we just uh, take this, put this into another protein, and then control, make nonlinear protein molecules? So another interesting study led by McHouse Group in Oxford showed that if you split this p like protein into two fragments, the resulting fragments, one is known as SpyTech, the other is called SpyCatcher, okay? If you mix them, you don't need to do too much engineering. If you mix them, they can also form this intermolecular, you know, lead to the formation of isopeptide bond between these molecules. It's an intermolecular process. Basically, in doing so, you can convert an intramolecular reaction into an intermolecular reaction. But for something to be useful, especially in the field of chemistry, okay, we want to be efficient. Not something that can, you know, if you can do it with 10% conversion, that's useless. Okay, you have no control over the process. So how can we improve the efficiency? Okay, so, so we want to have something that's super efficient, highly selective, and it can, it can rival, it'll be comparable with another type of paradigm in chemistry, click chemistry, okay? How can we do that? How can we improve the efficiency of such a reaction? So then it requires the utility of another important tool called the phage display to improve protein-protein or protein-peptide interactions. So that's why half of the price of this year went to these two biochemists. They invented this technology called the phage display. What phage display is able to do is that you can display one of the reactants or one of the partners on the phage surface, and then you immobilize the other on the column on solid substrate, okay? Randomize the genes that you inserted into the phage. Then you can ask these phage to display those genetic variants on their surface, and then you do the capture and the enrichment. Then you were able to evolve those new partners that show the higher improved affinity toward those immobilized substrates, okay? Remember, Manfred envisioned that we need a molecular evolutionary machine to do directed evolution. Phage is a perfect and ideal evolutionary machine because that's a perfect system that integrates phenotype with genotype. You change the DNA sequence, and then you result in the protein molecules with altered sequence, and then that will, the phenotype, the physical property arises from these genetic uh, protein variants. It's a perfect system. You can correlate genetic information with the protein sequence. So th this is great technology because uh, I think in 1970s we have had this great revolutionary technology called uh, hybridoma technology that enable us to mass produce, to engineer, to create monoclonal antibodies targeting different epitome, different molecule substrates you can define, okay? But there's a drawback for hybridoma technology. That's another Nobel Prize winning technology. The problem with hybridoma is that they can only generate mouse monoclonal antibody. If you want to use an monoclonal antibody for human therapies, you have to humanize it. It's extremely challenging, okay? That's a big bottleneck for using monoclonal antibodies for therapeutics. So with phage display technology, now you can just display those antibody fragments outside of the phage. Then you don't have to worry about humanization problem, okay? And then eventually, with the maturation of the technology, people developed this it's known as FAG, okay, antibody fragments, okay, to treat diseases like uh, uh, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, or a lot of other, you know, inflammation-related disease, okay? So you can circumvent humanization problems for the developing, for developing monoclonal antibody, okay? That's a, so let's go back, okay? How can we evolve SpyTech, SpyCatcher to make it a click chemistry-like you know, reaction? So Howard's just, uh, it's simple, very straightforward. First, Howard's displayed SpyTech variants on the phage surface. 
okay? He was able to evolve, improve the reactivity by mutating SpyTag. Once he ended up with several improved mutants, he further displayed spike catcher on the phage surface. You combine both, and then you were able to generate a new spike tag spike catcher chemistry that showed improved reactivity in test tube. Okay, once we have this, these optimized genetic engineered tools, so then we can use them to control protein topologies during cellular synthesis. So that's, that's what I did in Arnold's lab in collaboration with Dave Terrell, uh, another polymer chemist at Caltech. So we were able to make cyclic proteins, cyclic polymers, you know, by just a, it's simple, you begin with genetic design. You have elastin-like protein gene in the middle, and then you put the two spike catcher genes, spike tag spike catcher genes, you know, on both ends, and then you put the gene into E2 coli, you were able to make cyclic proteins. You can also make a, you can move the, one of the reactant into the middle of the gene, you can make tadpole-like molecules, okay? My, my colleague, Professor John Wenbin in Peking University further demonstrated that with these newly generated protein tools, they can create unconventional protein molecules with unconventional diverse topologies. They can make lasso, protein lasso. It can serve as a molecular switch. Okay, change the condition, it can change the conformation. Okay, it's a lasso. They can also make this branched protein molecules, star-like protein molecules. It's a good design strategy for creating synthetic vaccine. You can display multiple antigens on the surface, uh, on these, you know, branches, and also they were able to form this physically entangled cantonin structure, okay? And uh, a student in my lab, Zhong Guang is able to use cellular machinery to make forearm proteins, okay? Once you have this forearm building blocks, you, you just ask E. coli to make it, put the gene into the E. coli, and ask E. coli to make these forearm proteins, and then you mix it with, you know, proper building block, you can make an entirely protein-based network, okay? Then, this is a hydrogel materials, okay? So with hydrogel, you can do a variety of drug delivery or tissue regeneration. You can just use genetic programming to alter bio and the physical properties of this material system. All right, so this is Pretty much I, I can present today, you know, I just uh, spent uh, the last couple of days looking into literatures and try to put together these pictures. And uh, the th this is important, I, think, I hope, you know, what I present today is able to evolve and uh, inspire, even, you know, spark some new ideas from the audience, okay, from the young audience, okay? And more importantly, don't pay attention to what has already been done. Okay, the most important thing is looking for those what remains to be done. Okay, this is more important. Look into the future. Directed evolution is a great tool, but it's more a new way of thinking. Okay, how can we harness this type of philosophy? You know, Francis Arnold is a big believer in brute force. Okay, he said that evolution is something gentlemen don't do it, but uh, she's not a gentleman. Okay, you don't have to be gentleman to be a good researcher, okay? You have to believe in the force that's, you know, all has already been perfected by nature, okay? Directed evolution, you can come up with a variety of systems that can be improved, optimized. It's algorithm, it's simple. It's a stupidest algorithm, but that can be very useful, very easy to use, okay? So this is, let me end up with this lecture with Mary Curie's quote. Okay, be less curious about the people. Okay, people expect me to talk more about Francis Arnold. I, I think more important, we need to be curious about ideas, about science, or engineering problems in general. So, all right, thank you very much. So, if you want to know more about directed evolution, I hope you can join this event. Okay. It's by Hui Min Zhao.
they adopt this direct devolution into more complicated biological systems. And also we invited uh, some group alumni for this workshop. Yu Lian Chong is one of them. He's now doing synthetic biology, okay? Thank you for sharing this very wonderful story. So I actually have a question about this ter termination, about this direct evolution. Because you mentioned about the random mutagenesis mm -hmm. and from this functional screening, and finally you can find the very good enzyme. So I'm wondering, is this called the direct evolution? Because I'm not in this in uh, life science field. Evolution is simple, right? You combine you know, randomization with selection. That's a process called evolution. Why do we call it directed evolution? Because when we perform evolution in laboratory, we have a purpose. We inject a telos or end to this process. Okay, we always tilt the process of evolution toward our own goal. Okay, for example, if we are interested in thermal stability, you know, you would like to subject those genetic variants, put protein mutants, on the, you know, to a high temperature, see which one survives. And at the end, once you get the thermal stable protein variant, okay, that's the end goal. Okay, it's called a directed evolution. There's a direction. There's a purpose for whatever you do in the laboratory. Thank you. I have another question. Because we, we ask about the purpose of natural evolution. Do we know that? We don't know, right? I mean, this is a very philosophical problem. Okay, what's the telos of natural evolution? We know nothing about it. Okay, it, there's a big debate between who believe in God or who do not. Okay, so I, I think that's why we call it directed evolution. We inject the purpose, the telos, into the process. Right. Thanks. I have another okay. question. Um, because for each um, optimization process, you have the parent protein. And also the final, the good one, you selected through this functional screening. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering um, if we compare the parent protein and the final protein, there should be some very um, insight about the structure function right. correlation. I think this is the most that, important lesson we can learn from this. Yeah, that, that's another interesting, you, you can call it a byproduct of the process of direct evolution. It provides a new aspect or perspective for our understanding of how protein molecules work, okay? And uh, some of these detailed information cannot be revealed by routine traditional biochemical studies or structural studies. You have to do, do evolution because it turns out that some genetic mutations that occur to a very remotely, you know, to the catalytic site, okay? You cannot predict the, the impact or influence of this type of mutation to the reactivity of the enzyme. But it, it turned out that through evolution, this, these sites can be revealed, okay? Also sometimes there's some, a lot of so-called neutral mutations. People believe if you just replace, you know, serine with serine, you're not going to impact the protein activity dramatically, but uh, that's not the case in some direct evolution process. Neutral mutations can also generate a big impact on the protein activity. Okay, you have to uh, well, you have to get the molecule. Okay, then you will be able to see that interesting phenomenon. Okay. So uh, another thing, I think another important development in the field, you know, represented by David Baker in Washington University, they are perfecting the technology using computational design to design protein molecules, functional proteins, or catalysts. But nowadays, what the, at the best they can do is to make some bulk catalyst that shows minimal reactivity. Then you still need directed evolution, experimental lists to improve, to optimize the candidate. Okay, so it turned out that we cannot get away with directed evolution. No matter how smart you are, how clever you are, you know, we still need directed evolution to perfect these designs, artificial systems, right? I think another interesting example is in, in the field of synthetic biology, people 
build up a variety of genetic parts. You know, it's called a genetic circuit, or bio, let's call it a bio bricks. Okay, when they try to put together into a cellular system, compatibility is an issue. Okay, although they work well independently, but you put different genetic circuits into one cell, they have compatibility issue. Okay, and then some bioengineers try to harness the power of directed evolution to fine tune these biological systems to address or reconcile the incompatibility problem. Okay. So you, you cannot predict in these you know, prior knowledge, okay? Any more questions? It's as quiet as my class. Okay. Uh, the turn up is, the, the audience size is smaller than my class actually. Okay, but it's as quiet as. All right, so I won't keep you here. So thank you for coming. And I uh, hope I can see some of you in my future class, okay? Thank you.